Welcome to Fayetteville Community Church. We welcome our church family and our visiting friends. Thank you for coming to worship with us. To find out more about our church, upcoming events, and other church activities, you may visit us online at www.fccnc.us. But I, I talked about, in, in the first message, I talked about what it would be like if we took Donald Trump, who is who? The President of the United States. And we took LeBron James, who is one of the greatest basketball players who ever lived. And we took Brad Pitt, who is one of the always in People Magazine's top 100 or top 50 best looking people in the world. And then we took Bill Gates, who's one of the richest men ever. And we took all of those people and we morphed them into one individual. And by the world standards, we would have the most successful individual ever, the most powerful man in the world, one of the greatest athletes ever, ever born, one of, the, one of the best looking people and one of the richest people. But by what Jesus said, when they asked Jesus that question, do you think this would be a successful man? Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses what? He loses his soul. And so from that, we gathered that our success and our failures are not measured by what the world standard is. Our success is measured on, do you know Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life? And what are you doing for Jesus, the Son of God? And what are you doing and what difference are you making in the kingdom? And so that was, that's the way we established our first week. And then the second week, we talked about real leadership and how that Jesus came. And when Jesus came, the first thing he did, he went and got disciples or he got followers. And so we established that the way to be a great leader in whatever that you're doing is to first learn to be a follower and learn to have someone that you can follow and, and you can pattern your life after. And we, we follow, as Christian people, we follow the greatest leader that, we've, that the, the world has ever known. It's because that leader was sent from God above. And God so loved the world, the Bible says, that he sent his son, his name is Jesus, that he would come to this earth and he would give us an example. And he's given us the greatest example that we could ever, ever have. And today I want to talk to you about another subject that's real. Real success was first. Real leadership was second. And today I want to talk to you about satisfaction. Real satisfaction. Rolling Stone magazine rates this song as the number two song on its 500 greatest songs ever written. And when VH1 did the 100 the hundred greatest rock and roll songs of all time, this song was number one. And I bet most of you know what the song is. And I bet you can finish my first line. It says, I can't get no satisfaction. That's it. That's the song. <laughs> Some of y'all didn't spend all y'all's time in church, did you? I see how that goes. Some of y'all out of other places. But let me tell you this. And what group did that? Look, look at this picture. If that's where you're finding satisfaction, y'all, you can forget it. If that's it right there, you ain't going to find it there. But all of us battle with, with satisfaction and contentment. All of us battle with, with one thing, and it's one little word. And you know what that word is? More. More. And there are advertising executives that are on Madison Avenue in New York City that are driving around in Lamborghinis and everything else that you can imagine that wear the finest suits and wear white shirt, crisp shirts every day. And they make sure that as, as a people, we stay discontented on what we have. They, that we stay in a state of wanting more. Why do you think that they would spend $5 million on a 30-second commercial in the Super Bowl? Because it puts us in a place 
where we don't think we have everything that we need or want. We, we, it puts us in a place that we're always wanting what? More. Say it again with me. More. More. I remember there was a, a movie one time, and um, the, it was about, a, I can't remember the name of the movie, but it was about a little uh, robot, and it was Johnny Five. Remember Johnny Five? And he was always going, more input, more input. He was a little computer. What was it? Short circuit, that's right. And, he, and all he wanted as a computer was more input. More, 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 more. It's the American dream. It's more money, more success, more square footage, more luxuries. Either that or if you're not living for more, you're living for next. The next raise. Or your next house. Or your next car. Or your next purchase. And I'm the same way. I cannot wait to when someone gives me an Amazon gift card. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I, I cannot wait to go on Amazon Prime and see what I can have shipped to my house free in two days. <laughs> Any of y'all guilty with me? Yes. Stuff you don't even need. But it's Amazon Prime. Yeah, I get it free. No, you don't. But we just can't. <laughs> Hannah's got an Amazon gift card right there in her, in her hand. <laughs> Hannah, we got somebody that needs that this morning. Would you give that to me? <laughs> <laughs> but we just can't find satisfaction. So many people go through life thinking that, that you're going to find contentment. If, if I could just relocate, they'd be content. If you could just find another church, you'd be content. If I could just find another job or another community or another job in the same community. If I could just find something else, I'd be content. And you know, speaking of jobs, there is so much discontentment about people in the work environment that 80% of working Americans say that they are not content where they work. 80%. And I bet if we polled that this morning and asked all of you, it would follow right down that same line. Some of you, your bosses are here, and they're going, <laughs> looking at you. Reality check. Real satisfaction, real success, real leadership. Where are you, and what would your life look like if you did a reality check against the Word of God for the real purpose and the real meaning of who you are? What would it look like? What would, what would where the place that you're living at look like when you compare it? To the Word of God and what the Word says that we should look for in real contentment and real satisfaction. There's an entire book in the Bible that a man wrote that talked about being content and being satisfied. And if you, it'll maybe, it may even surprise you that when he wrote this book, he was in prison and he was chained to a Roman soldier and 24 hours a day. He was stuck. He couldn't leave. But the Bible says that this man experienced satisfaction like we can't imagine. You know the man I'm talking about, what his name was? Paul. Paul. And he wrote, the, he wrote most of the New Testament. And he wrote a book called Philippians, and he said this in the book of Philippians. And if you want to turn, I want you to look at this in your Bible. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 12. And I'm going to read it. This is the NIV. Read this with me. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. Whether well-fed or hungry. He'd learned a valuable lesson. He'd learned a valuable secret. He had learned how to be content under the worst of circumstances. I don't know if, he, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I don't know how many of you have ever been in jail or in prison or been chained to a Roman guard. But I would bet it's not the happiest day of your life. I would bet that whatever they brought you to eat wouldn't be like going to Bojangles. I love some Bowberry biscuits, don't y'all? <laughs> Let's just stop and thank the Lord for Bojangles right now. Father, we just want to stop. <laughs> Lord, we know dirty rice is probably something we should not partake of, but we do love it, Lord. Amen. But I guarantee you he wasn't getting no kind of Bojangles when he was chained to a Roman guard. If you don't get anything else this morning, I want you to get this one thing. Look at this. 
Contentment is being satisfied with God and God alone. That's tough. But if you want to truly find your contentment in your place, it has to begin with a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you don't have that relationship with him, then Mr. Danny, we ain't never going to find it in searching for relationships that are here on earth. I've heard Vivian say this so many times. Until, until we go vertical with our relationships, our horizontal relationships will never pan out. Until we go vertical, until we look up to from the place where our help comes from, the horizontal relationships, JC, are never going to work out. Because we're out of order. We're out of the place we should be. We seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all the other, what? Things will be added unto us. So contentment is being satisfied with God. I want to give you just a few things, three, three, three things especially this morning. That I feel like that we can take from, from Paul's writings in the book of Philippians. Number one, be content with God's presence in your life. Be content with the presence of God in your life. Now if you're here this morning and you have never accepted, accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. This is where we have to begin. Because if you don't have a relationship and you don't know Jesus as the Lord of your life, or if, if you have, you've known him at a certain point in your life, but you've fallen away, and you don't have that everyday personal, hello Jesus, how are you doing today? And he says, hey, how are you doing? If you don't have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, then that's where we have to start. Because everything else about your life, you're going to live in discontentment until that area of your life is shored up. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Even though Paul, you know, we, he was in the, in the middle of hard circumstances. Even though that he was in a place that probably he was even wrongly accused and he was thrown in jail for maybe something that he didn't have any business being in there. Paul did not consider himself a victim in that situation. He considered himself a victor in every situation because of the Lord Jesus Christ that was inside of him. Did you get that statement? He didn't consider himself a victim. He considered himself a victor in that. Paul had made his mind up to be satisfied, look at this, with who he was and where he was and with what he had. He had made his mind up. Now, did his circumstances lend him to a place to where he was that way? Was everything around him just perfect? Did he have the perfect meal? Did he have the perfect buddy that he was chained to? No. But he had come, it made his what? He had made up his mind to be satisfied with who he was and where he was and with what he had. He had made his mind up. I love that. Philippians 4.10, which is two verses before we just read, it says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. He, he wasn't looking at the interest rates, what they were on the outside, or the economy, or the things that were going to be a blessing to him later on down the road in his life. It had nothing to do with whether he was laying on a cot, or in the, in the hay, or in, on concrete, or on rocks, or whatever, or on a sort of perfect mattress. Sleep number. How many of you know your sleep number? Yeah, me neither. But he wasn't concerned about, about whether he was laying with his head on a stone, or his head on a $200 goose down pillow. Because he learned that things will not satisfy you. Things will not satisfy you. We've always heard whoever dies with the most, to the most toys wins. Whoever dies is dead. <laughs> How many toys you got don't matter at that point. And all the things that you thought you could drag into your life, Mike, to satisfy you, ain't going to do you a whole lot of good at that point. There's a lot of people out there who are still trying to get ahead. And if they would stop where they are and take stock of where they are and who they are and who they serve, they would be way better in the scheme of their life. And this morning, if, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then I hope that everyone that is coming to this house this morning, or everyone that's listening this morning, if you're not a follower, that today's your day. But if you are a follower, 
and you have accepted Jesus Christ, and you are walking on the road that he calls straight and narrow, then you need to stop where you are and begin to take inventory of your life and be gracious and be thankful for everything that God has done for you and everything that God has given you and start thanking God for what you have instead of complaining about the things that you don't have. I read somewhere, and I, I read this Teresa this week when I was working on this. Contentment will make a poor man rich, and discontentment will make a rich man poor. Man, look at that. Contentment will make a poor man rich, but discontentment will make a rich man poor. It's not what you have that's going to bring you satisfaction. What will bring you satisfaction is knowing who you have in your life. That's the beginning of finding true commitment, I mean true contentment and true satisfaction. is knowing who you've got in your life. Hebrews 13, 5 says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God said, I will never fail you and I will never abandon you. I'm going to be with you. How much stuff do you think you need to be satisfied? How many things do you think you need to be satisfied? There was a sociologist discovered, look at this, I think this is a crazy, it's a crazy fact. In, in 1900, that the American citizen in 1900 wanted 72 different things. If, you, if they wrote down the things that they wanted in, in the year 1900, they wanted 72 different things. And they considered 18 of those things essential to their life. They wanted 72 things, but they considered 18 things essential to their life. Today, the average American wants 500 different things, but considers one of them essential. Think about that. One of the secrets to satisfaction is not having a lot of things, but believing that what you already have is going to be enough. My God will always be enough. There's a story that I read about a king that was unhappy and he was looking for contentment. And he was calling all of his astrologers around him. And he told them, he said, if you can find me a contented man in all of my kingdom, bring his shirt back to me. And let me put on the shirt of a contented man and I'll be satisfied. So the king sent all of his astrologer buddies out and they searched all over the kingdom for a satisfied and contented man so they could get his shirt and bring it back to the king like he asked. When they finally found the most contented, satisfied man in all, in the, in all of the kingdom, guess what? He didn't own a shirt. He was satisfied right where he was and with what he had. I want you to learn something in this this morning. If you have God in your life, then you should not have a need or a want for anything else. If you truly have God in your life, and your relationship is with Him, and you are cultivating that relationship with Him, and believing God for everything that you need and everything that you want and desire for you and your family, then you shouldn't need anything else. There's not a need that you want or a want that you have or desire that God either hasn't already met or already knows about. He knows everything about you. He knows your heart's desires, and he promised us that he would give us our heart's desires. So number two, be confident in God's power through your life. Now let's look at this. Let's, d let's dive in a little bit deeper. Are you with me this morning? Okay, stay with me, all right? Be confident in God's power through your life. Having God's power working inside of you and being manifest in you and out of you and through you in every single area of your life. Being confident and knowing that if I have God and I have his power in my life, Jerry, that there's nothing that I can't do. There's nothing that I can't do. So let's look at this. So in verse 13 of that same chapter, Paul goes on to say, I can do, and we read it from the, from the King James, I can do all things. But the NIV says, I can do everything through him who gives me what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do everything 
through him that gives me strength. Now, let's, let's, let's look at this just for a second. He's not saying, I can do everything I want to do. He's not saying that. Because how many know you cannot do everything you want to do? That ain't true in y'all's life. You ain't been to my mom and daddy's house, then I can promise you that. But what he was saying with, what he was saying was, I ought to be satisfied with who I am because through Christ I can do the things that I ought to do. Now let's just dive in a little more. Because you can do anything that God calls you to do and you can do anything that Christ wants to do through you. Now look at that. I'm I'm not... I'm not one of these people that have some kind of blind, positive thinking that if I sit still long enough and just begin to believe, 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 believe that I'm going to get, that that, that this is going to raise up in front of me, that I'm going to get it all of a sudden. I believe you have to act on your faith. You have to move on the faith that God has given you. You have to apply the faith that Jesus has given you, that you have to work it. You have to know that if God says it, he will do it, and it settles it. You don't have to worry about it anymore. If God's word says it, it's done. You can do anything. I heard about these two drunk guys that were in a hotel. And they were both drunk. And one, and one guy jumped out the window and killed himself. And the other guy was still inside. And the police came and got him. And said, why did he jump out the window? And he said, well. He said, well. No. He said, well. <laughs> he was drinking and he thought he could fly around the building. And the police said, well, why didn't you stop him? He said, because I thought he could do it too. <laughs> he thought it. He was thinking it. Some of you are going, that's the first thing I've understood that he said all day. <laughs> no. <laughs> you can't do anything you, that you just think. But you can do anything that God calls you to do. And you can do anything that Christ wants to do through you and your life. That's why as a follower of Jesus Christ, no should never be an answer. You can love, the God, love God with all of your heart and all your soul and all of your mind. You can serve others in a place of ministry. You can share your story. You can do all of those things. Why? Because we can do all those things through Christ who strengthens us. I want you to remember this principle. Anything that God calls you to do or commands you to do, he will also give you the power and the ability to do. Somebody say amen. That anything God calls you to do or commands you to do, he will also give you the power and the ability to do. That's freeing. Why is it freeing? It's because... It's our responsibility is to respond to God's ability. Our responsibility is just to respond to the ability that our Heavenly Father has. And it takes the pressure off of you. Some of you toil and you work so hard and you're pushing on the things that you're trying to get done when God's going, (whistles) just waiting. Go ahead, keep pushing. But our responsibility, put that back up if you would, Rhonda. Our responsibility is responding to the ability of God who says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can do anything that you ought to do and anything that God calls you to do if you will be confident in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Doggone it, I love that. I love that. That's shouting to me. Is that all right, Daddy? Good. All right. Be confident in the power that God has given you and the ability. And number three, be comforted. Be comforted with the provision that God has put in your life. Be comforted with God's provision in your life. Be comforted. Now let's look at this. The 19th verse of Philippians, and a lot of you can probably say this verse by heart. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. 
My God will meet all of my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Think about it. Some of you that are struggling and some of you that are having trouble in your life, you need to stop right here and say that. Maybe you've never thought about it. And my God, who I have confidence in, and my God, who has the ability to do anything, my God, not my mom's God, not my dad's God, but my God will supply everything that I need according to his riches in glory. Not according to what I think he should do in a situation, but according to the way that he does it. There's no greater promise in the Bible than this one. That if you're right with God, and you are giving God what God has commanded you to give, then there's nothing in your life that will, and there's nothing in your life that will be an obstacle in the pipeline of God's blessing. Then any real need you have is going to be met by God. Now look at that again. If you're right with God, you're giving unto God what God has commanded you to give. If there's nothing in your life that will be an obstacle in God's pipeline of blessing, then any need, real need that you have is going to be met by God. That's a big old statement right there, boys and girls. If you're right with God, if you hadn't stolen from Him, but you're giving to Him, and if there isn't things in your life, sin in your life, that's an obstacle in the pipeline of blessing. But see, a lot of times God is waiting on us to remove the obstacles out of our life so He can truly be a blessing to us. A lot of people understood, understand that promise of God meeting our needs as to God meeting your greeds. There's a big difference. He is not promised to supply everything you want. He's promised to supply everything that you need. Because many times we need things that we don't want. And then there's other times that we want things that we don't need. We need things we don't want. I, I know this may shock the pants off of some of you. But when I was growing up, every once in a while, my dad gave me a whipping. I, I know it's shocking. I know you don't believe it. But there was times that he whooped me. And he would come to me. Not, not enough, though, huh, Daddy? <laughs> and he would come to me, and he would look at me, and he will say, Son, you need a whipping. I don't ever remember a time that he came to me, and he said, Son, you need a whipping. And I said, Yes, I do. <laughs> In fact, when he come to me and say that, I promise you, Randy, I disagreed with him in a major way. No, 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 no. But there were times that I needed a whipping, but I didn't want no whipping. It was different in what I needed and what I wanted. Then there's other times in our life that we want things that we just don't need. A lot of you probably in here this morning watched Billy Graham's service this week. His wife, Ruth Graham, who had died a few years previous, she said this. She said, if, if it had not been for God in my life, I would have married the wrong man three times. And she said this. She said, I thought I knew what I wanted, but God knew the man that I needed. See, sometimes the things that we want, we just don't need. But he said this, he said, I will meet all of your needs according, according to my, rich, my riches and glory. Now think about this for just a second. Th think about if, if I had a million dollars in my pocket. All right? That is bulging pocket. But if I had a million dollars with me 
And there was a man that came to me, and he was begging. And he said, I need money. And I have a million dollars with me. And I reach in my pocket, and out of my pocket, I give him a dollar. Now, I have given him out of my pocket, right? But suppose the same man came to me, and he said, I need money. And I reached in my pocket, and I gave him $100,000. There's a difference when God gives you a blessing according to what he has. You see, I could have just given the man the blessing that he wanted and given it out of my out of my pocket and given him a dollar. Or I can reach in and bless him according to what I have. And see, we stay in a place all the time where we are praying for God for one specific give some of your phone, Patrick. We're believing the God, we're believing God for this, whatever this is in our life. This one thing. God, if you would just do this one thing in my life, if you would just give me this phone that I have desired so much, if you would give me this, I would be content and I would be happy. And you're expecting God to bless you out of his pocket. But what God is wanting to do is to give you Verizon. And he's wanting to give you and bless you according to his riches in glory. But we're so stove up looking for that one thing in our life and just saying we limit God so much as to giving us a dollar when he wants to give us a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand, and but we're so specific, and we just, rather than say, "God, bless me according to your riches," Jay, I love that. I love that. I love that. That speaks to me right there. That I have put so many restrictions on the blessing of the Lord because I want this. Because I think that this is the best thing that I need. And you know what God says to me? Just like he said to the children of Israel. Okay, Hot Rod, take another lap around. I've got the promised land over here waiting for you. But yet, you're still tripping over the obstacles in your life every single day. You're still living so far below the abundant life that I've given you. You say, God, I want this, and I want this, and I want this. And he says, I am ready to do exceedingly and abundantly above and beyond what you could ever ask or what you could ever think. Because in our feeble mind, amen, in our feeble mind that we have, all we know to do is beg for a dollar. But he wants to give us the riches according to what he has. Whoo, I love that. That is good preaching. I don't care who you are. I love that. He says, I will. I will. That's a confident statement from the King of kings and Lord of lords. I will supply all of your needs According to my riches and glory. If there's a need in your life, God will provide. And he will provide in a way that you never could imagine he provided. For a month. For a month I've had a sick horse. Every horse that I've got at, at, in my barn were given to me. I don't have any horses that are high dollar horses. They were all given to me. They, they match the, mis, the misfit profile of all of us. <laughs> I have a horse that was sick, and Teresa and I were on a trip, and the girl that, one of the girls that helps take care of the horses while we're gone um, couldn't get the horse to eat. 
the horse wouldn't use the bathroom. And um, we, she concocted this mixture from a vet. Got her back. She started eating a little more. She started using the bathroom more. We took her out of the stall and put, put her back outside. And she started grazing a little bit more. We, you know, we supplement hay. And right now the grass is starting to turn green, so the horses are thrilled. She started eating a little bit more. Well, then I came back in the last couple of weeks after we got back from that trip. And I noticed that she'd been losing weight. She was eating every day. And I, I, I kind of watched how much hay she was eating. But she was losing weight still. And she'd probably lost 150 pounds or more. I mean, the horse weighs 800 pounds, but she was losing weight. And you can see her hips. And I knew something was going on with her. So I struggled all this week. And I've been doctoring this horse all this week. And so I called one of my buddies that I graduated from high school with as a vet. And uh, I said, I said, Willie, I said, man, I got a sick horse. I said, I need you to come check my horse out. So he came and checked her out yesterday. And again, this has been a four-week ordeal that we've been dealing with this horse. You know how it is, Gary. You hate to see him like that, you know. So he came down and, and he told me, he said, Wes, he said, um, if we have to put the horse down, he said, um, I won't put the horse down until you have a hole dug to bury the horse. And you can't go out and, oh, you guess you can, but I ain't, and dig a hole for a horse with a shovel. Can you say amen? You need a little bit more reinforcements. So I called a kid yesterday morning, and I, I asked him, I said, hey, man, I hate to ask you this on a Saturday. I said, but the vet's coming to my house, and I said, I may have to put one of my horses down. I said, would you, um, would you help me? He said, man, I don't know. He said, I, I, let me see what I can do. I'll see if I can get the backhoe this morning. So anyway, the vet came. We put the horse down, and the kid came almost at the same time. And he began to dig the hole back in the back of the pack. So he got the hole dug. We took the horse and laid her down in the bottom. We covered her up. We got ready to leave. And I told him, I reached in my pocket. And I said, man, thank you so much for helping me. And I gave him, I had five 20s. And I gave him $100 for coming and helping me bury my horse. So he didn't look at what I'd given him. He just stuck in his pocket. So I'm back in the back with him. And he takes the back hoe and he's driving back across the field he said can I talk to you when you get to your house I said, sure when I got to the house he jumped off the back hoe and I walked out there behind him he said will you pray for me I was like yes sir he said we're struggling we're struggling bad will you pray for me and my wife and my family sure so I laid hands on him and I began to pray for him Right there behind the old backhoe. And he said, uh, you'll never know what that $100 meant to me. He said, we can, we'll go this morning. He said, and I can buy groceries for me and my family. You see, my story wasn't about the horse. My story was that God had provision for this kid for him and his family to eat four weeks before when my horse started getting sick because he knew that four weeks down the road there was going to be a young man who needed provision for his wife and his children and God already had made provision with my horse being sick to provide for him that's how much God loves you. That he is ready to bless you in ways that you can't think or that you can't imagine. That he's providing an old 30-year-old horse life for 30 years. Great life for 30 years. And her getting sick right at the right moment where you don't have any money to provide for your family but you can dig a hole with a backhoe. That ain't chance, boys and girls. That's my God supplying your needs according to his riches and glory right when you need it. 
whatever you need. Whatever you're not satisfied with in your life. Whether it's a sick horse waiting over here in the wings. Or in the place of Abraham and Isaac. Whether there's, he's coming up the mountain on one side to take his son to sacrifice him. And some of you may be in that thinking, oh God, what have I got to give up before you're going to provide for me? Well, guess what? The entire time that Abraham was walking up with his son, knowing what he had to do with the top of the mountain, there was provision climbing up the other side in the place of a ram. And every step, every step that Abraham took to go to the top of that mountain, there was a ram climbing on the other side. And God's provision was being made because of the obedience that he had. Because the Bible says that obedience to the Lord is better than sacrifice. Oh, <laughs> Do you get that? God has provision being made for you in ways that you can't imagine. And he just wants you to say, God, it's your responsibility. And I'm going to believe on your ability to do what I need in my life. I got this story about this lady. She could barely make ends meet. I want you to look at this. Her tenant, she was renting an apartment, and her tenant was walking by her door, and she had her door open. It was hot in the house that she lived in. And he heard her praying this. He said, Lord, I, she said, Lord, I'm hungry. I'm out of groceries. My pension is out, and I don't get a check for another week, and I don't know how I'm going to eat. Lord, I know that you've been faithful, and I know that I've tithed to you this month. I know I've given what I'm supposed to give. And God, I'm asking for you to provide me something to eat even this week. I believe you will do it because of your promise to me. And her landlord or her tenant who didn't believe in the Lord, he was an atheist for all practical purposes. He heard her through the door of her apartment or her house. And he thought, you know what, I'm going to get this old woman. So he went to the grocery store and he bought three bags full of turkeys and chicken and meat and vegetables and milk. And while he was gone... He took his tenant's key and snuck into her apartment and put everything on the kitchen table. And then he just waited around the corner for her to come back. Later on, she walked back into her house and she saw, saw the groceries on her table and she fell to her knees. And she said, Lord, thank you for this miracle. I don't know where these groceries came from, but I knew you would look after me. I knew you would meet every need that I have in my life, just like you said. About that time, the guy jumped from behind the door, and he said, Woman, you're a fool. I heard you praying today, and I was the one that bought those groceries for you, and I wanted to show you how foolish it was to believe in God. And the lady looked up at him with a great big old smile on her face. She said, That's all right with me. It doesn't bother, bother me at all that God sent these groceries to me by the devil himself. <laughs> yeah. God has provision for you in every area of your life waiting. And it may not be the way that you think it's going to be answered. Because, see, we're expecting God to bless us out of his pocket. But he wants to bless us according to his riches. Waiting. Waiting. Provision is there. Be content in what God's given you. Be content in knowing that your responsibility is loving the one who has the ability to meet your need. And that takes the pressure off, don't it, Randy? Our, our, our position is just to love. Love him and serve him and getting every obstacle that's in our way out. And watching him do what he's going to do. I want you to look at this, and I'm going to close with this right here. There was a, a follower of Jesus in his later years. He had learned lessons about what we're talking about this morning, about how to be content and how to have peace. And what was the, the secret of his satisfaction. I want you to look at this. You can read along while I read it. But this is what he said. 
It consists for me and nothing more than making a right use of my eyes. In whatever state I am, I first of all look up to heaven and remember that my principal business here is to get there. Then I look down upon the earth and call to mind how small a place I shall occupy when I die and I'm buried. I then look around in the world and observe what multitudes there are who are in many respects more unhappy than I am. Then I learn where true happiness is and that all my cares are going to eventually end and then I don't really have any reason to complain. You set your eyes not on the things that are around you. See how much space you're going to occupy when it's all over. But you set your eyes on where you're going and where you're heading and who's taking you there and who's going to come and get you there. If God is all you have, then God is all you will ever need. If God's all you have, then God's all you will ever need. Father, I thank you so much for provision in every area of our life. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving us enough and caring for us enough to give us a promise that you will supply all of our needs. Stand with me this morning. I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a, 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 a twofold or a, a kind of a two different things this morning. One of the things that I said this morning was that God is ready, waiting to supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory, and I think you guys understood that. One of the things that I talked about is being in the right place with your Heavenly Father. In giving, in giving out of your need, and giving out of the seed that He's given you, so that God has something to work with. Because, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to get on, <laughs> I'm not doing an invitation on tithing. But if I want corn, I've got to plant what kind of seed? Corn seed. If I want tomatoes, I got to plant tomato seed. If I need finances in my life and I need God to bless my finances, then I need to give out of my need. And I need to plant seed in a place that's fertile and I need to give. And some of you have been blocking the blessing of the Lord from just not giving. And you wonder why at the end of the month you can't get to the end of the month. It's because you haven't put any seed that God can bless. And, and if you've never given or you've never tithed and you, you, you're always backwards on everything, that's the only thing in the Bible that he says, try me and see if I won't pour, open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that you can't imagine or contain. So if you're in a place that your finances are hurting and you haven't been giving, I'm just going to just put this one plain. Try that. Try it. And just see. But the other thing that I spoke about was being in a place that God wants to bless you, but there are obstacles in your life, and you know what they are. And there are things in your life that are blocking the blessing of God from you. It'd be like going out onto the beach and wanting to get a suntan, but sitting under a tent all day long. You're never going to get no sun. As long as you stay inside, ain't no vitamin D going to come into you. But once you step out of that tent, then the sun begins to shine on you. And you begin to tan. You begin to look healthy. It's the same thing with obstacles in your life. And some of you are living under a tent. And you need to unzip that tent and walk out. And you need to lay those obstacle things down, Joe. 
things that have held you back, and things that are not only holding you back from who you need to be, but are holding back the blessing of God from your life. And you wonder why that you keep going around the same place again. It's because God just waiting for you to go, I'm done with that. I'm finished. I'm not doing that anymore. And God, God's going, yes, finally. There are obstacles that you need to lay down this morning. I'm going to ask any of you to come this morning that need a blessing from the Lord to come and lay down those things. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it an addiction. You can call it a sin. You can call it a thought. You can call it a choice. You can call it whatever you want. But there's something blocking the blessing from you. And you know what it is. And you get in that place and God is just waiting to bless you. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and we're going to pray that the obstacles will be gone. Because he's a chain breaker. He's a chain breaker. I promise you that he is. That's what happened to Paul when he was chained. They began to sing and what happened? Broke. Chains broke. Come on down this morning. Come down. We'll believe that God will break the chains. He'll, he'll remove the obstacles in your life. And it ain't rocket science, y'all. That's right. The blessing is one decision away from, from what? From flowing. The blessing is one decision away from flowing through you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hannah. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? You're one decision away from blessing. I mean, you th you think if you just think about that. Do I come down and I receive the blessing, God, or do I lap the mountain again? Do you go through the same junk you've been going through again? Or do you make a decision? Or do you make that decision? Thank you, Jesus. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. Sing with me. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lie. And if you're trying to feel the same old holes inside, well, there's a better life. There's a better life. Come on now. You got pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. Come on now. And we've all run in things that no ain't just ain't right. But there's a better life. There's a better life. Come on, raise your hands and sing. If you got pain.
freedom. If you need freedom, save it. He's a prison shaking Savior. You've got chains. He's a chain breaker. So, Lord, for all the obstacles and all the chains and all the things that just drag us back, Lord, release the chains. You promised that you have come to set the captives free. And that, Lord, if truly we are one choice away from a blessing, then we choose this day who we're going to serve. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. So, Lord, for everyone that has walked to this altar this morning, and for those that are still at their seats, Lord, we know what the obstacles are in our lives. So we ask you, Lord Jesus, to break the chains, to remove the obstacles, to take the tent away, Lord, that we can walk into your marvelous light. Lord, allow us to begin to understand what contentment is in serving you. In serving you. I want you to lift your hands and begin to just worship the Lord. Because the next part is, if you believe it, you receive it. You can feel it. If you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you believe it, receive it. If you can feel it, somebody testify. Come on, do it one more time right here. If you believe it, sing it. If you receive it, if you can feel it. Somebody testify. Come on, sing that one more time. If you believe it, if you believe it, then receive it. You receive it. If you can feel it, somebody testify. He's got chains. He's a pain every person that is in this place or every person that is listening that Lord truly you would provide provision for our needs Lord I know there are folks that are listening to me right now that says pastor you cannot imagine what my need is well you and I cannot imagine what his glorious riches are either so where we're looking for a handout of a dollar he's looking to bless us according to his glorious riches. Will you lift up your hands and say this? Say, Lord Jesus, I receive a blessing for me and my household according to your glorious riches. I thank you, Lord, for your word where it says that you will, that you will, that you will supply my every need according to your glorious riches. So just begin to thank Him for whatever that need is in your life. Thank Him right now. Father, we thank You. We thank You for supplying our every need. We thank You that everything that we ask, that we believe, Lord Jesus, You will give us. Come on, don't stop there. Begin to thank Him for those things. We thank You, Lord Jesus. We bless You, Lord Jesus. We thank You for supplying our needs, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. See there? When you ask, he'll bring blue jeans in here for you. Yes! All your needs. Look at somebody and say, I believe it for you. Say it again. Look them straight in the eye. 
I, I believe it for you. I believe it for you. I do. Love somebody before you leave this morning. God bless you.